Okay, so the last thing we were doing well was looking at the turbo code. If I'm not wrong, look at the look, I gave gave you a description of the decoder, how it works. There was one minor point there which was uh, which was left open. Basically, how do you incorporate the a priori information in the uh, MAP decoder? So I'm I'm going to briefly mention that, not not in great detail, but uh, so so what will happen in the MAP decoder is for each branch there will be a branch metric. Okay, so that branch metric will be something like this. See, what is a branch? Branch is a any branch is, uh, is a transition from a state S1 to S2, right? You can describe a branch as S1, S2, okay? Corresponding to every branch, there will be a branch metric in your MAP decoder, okay? So the branch metric, okay, okay, is actually it contains a few other terms, but it will also contain this term. It will contain a term probability of uh s1 comma s2 given r okay so remember this branch metric at stage i okay so let's say this is a branch of stage i branch metric of this branch at stage i would be i'll have to use ri okay so the received values corresponding to that stage and probability that that transition happened what 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 does what do we mean by the transition happened corresponding to this transition there will be a symbol vector right right corresponding to each branch there would have been a certain output symbol vector okay so each branch corresponds to what an input bit stroke say multiple output bits and after modulation each of those output bits become symbols okay so this when i say s1 comma s2 i mean those symbols it will have a uh, some something like this okay so in fact you can even write this uh, si in terms of the input bit if you want right right it corresponds to a particular input bit also right so it also corresponds to an input bit i don't know i think maybe i'll call it mi okay so the input bit so this is the uh, symbol corresponding to i think u u is the notation we used right am i right ui okay uh, symbol symbols this is the input bit okay so some such uh, probability will be in board okay and when you actually try to compute this probability you'll have to do base rule okay when you use base rule you will get some a priori a posteriori type probabilities and using that's where you introduce your uh, introduce your uh, a priori probabilities okay so there'll be a term like this this will come from what's called gamma in the branch the branch metric is usually called gamma okay so gamma will have a term like this and there you can naturally use probabilities for a priori probabilities for ui can be used here okay so some such there will be a probability that involves only, see the important thing is this probability involves only what? Only things, are, things that correspond to stage i. Okay? So that's where you introduce this a priori probability. Okay? From, from the previous iteration from the other decoder, you would have got some a priori probabilities. You use that here. Okay? So that's just, just to make that very specific. Okay? So that kind of winds up our uh, turbo decoder. So there's one other thing in relation to convolutional codes <coughs> which I have not talked about at all. Okay, so that is basically structural properties and uh, distance properties. Okay, so I have not talked about those things at all, and I'll just quickly, briefly mention this once again with just a simple example, just for completeness, because I think there are some problems in the homework which are based on this, and I don't want to miss out on those problems. Okay, so let's see. So this is a brief discussion of free distance and error events. Okay, so, so again I'm going to do this with an example. My convolutional encoder is going to be a simple feed forward non-recursive encoder. Okay, so I'm going to take a trellis for this. Let me, let me draw the trellis. Okay, so the trellis is going to start. So I need a few stages for the trellis. So I'll do, if I do an arbitrary stage, I know it's got four states right okay so i think let's let's label them 0, 0, 0, 1, 
1011 then where will the transitions happen okay if the input is 0 you will go to 00, zero. If the input is 1 you will go to 10 the same thing happens for 01 also for 10 you go to these two guys Okay, so this is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. This would be 0, 1, 1. Am I right? 1, 0, 0. And I could be wrong here. Is it what? This is 0, what? 0, 1 or what? One zero, and the input is 0. You should get 1, 0, right? 1, 0. 101 then 001 110 okay so this was my uh, trellis and i'm going to take multiple copies of this hopefully i should get that in this okay i don't know what's going to come and what's not going to come so let's try it. Oops. Okay. We've got to undo now. Okay. Let me try and put it very carefully on top. Okay, I think that's that's good enough, right? It's not too bad. Okay, so you can see the trellis. Okay, so I'm going to do one more copy. Okay, so I'm going to have to do some erasing here. Erasing here, erasing here, some drawing here. Okay, I know it's not a perfectly drawn trellis. Hopefully, you can you can see how the trellis works. Okay, so that's how the trellis works. Okay, so so basically, what what is an error event and what's free distance? Okay, so think of convolutional code. If think of a block code. Okay, and suppose you transmit the all zero code word. Okay. Suppose somebody were to ask you, what's the most likely erroneous code word that you that you will output? How will you answer that question? Suppose you do BPSK, AWG, and whatever. What is the most likely erroneous code word that you would output? Yeah, so I think in, in block codes, what's the answer? In general, it is a code word of least weight, right? Because, I mean, that's closest from your original code word. Suppose you deviated a little bit, you would come back to a code word of least weight maybe all zero or some if at all you go off somewhere you will come back to a code word of least weight so okay so same thing happens here suppose so as, as suppose you transmitted the all zero sequence okay every code word corresponds to a path in the trellis so you are you are you traverse the top path okay what is the most likely erroneous path that you are likely to output in some way it should be closest to the all zero path okay so if at all it deviates away from the all zero path it should come back as quickly as possible okay so if you write down an, an erroneous path which deviates from the all zero path and comes back real quick you can talk about that as an error event okay so error events are basically okay so i have to be careful here i mean i'm just going to loosely say most likely erroneous paths okay so this makes a lot of sense so for instance one thing that's very useful is to come up with an erroneous path of least weight. What do I mean by weight of the path? Each path corresponds to a code word. The weight of that code word is the weight of that path. Okay, so if you take a path, you can take a sequence of outputs that correspond to that path. The weight of that is the weight of the path. Okay, so if I if I ask the question, what's the error event of least weight? Okay, naturally that becomes the most likely error event because I'm unlikely to make errors that are too far away okay so in this case if you want to draw something like 
the error event of least weight since there are very few states and very few transitions one can easily just eyeball that right so you you're going to make first of all an error and deviate from the all zero state so you you have to deviate if you don't deviate there's no error right so you deviate you get here and then you have to quickly come back to the all zero state one way of doing it is this path okay but the question is is there any other path right so the weight of this path is what Five, right? The weight of this path is five. You've got a one one here, and you've got a one zero here, and you've got a one one here. Okay, so the weight of this path is five. So the question is, can there be any other path of lesser weight? Okay. So the answer here seems just I was looking at it carefully. It seems obvious. Okay. But if the number of states is two fifty six. and you have a 4 by 5 code a lot of transitions happening and it's not very easy to find okay and you need a method for doing it and there are methods yeah one can use a modification of the viterbi algorithm to uh, or any other shortest path algorithm on the graph to find this also or you can also have analytical methods based on things called mason's formula etc of analyzing the state state diagram very carefully one can have all those things and accurately find the this uh, weight of the uh, lowest weight for an error event okay so that lowest weight is also called free distance okay so free distance is assuming all the uh, this this the weight of uh, the lowest uh, most likely error event is also called the free distance okay so those are the two definitions which i want to write down Okay, so I should be careful here when I make these definitions. There are a lot of rigorous ways of defining it. I'm giving you a loose definition. So in this trellis, d free. Okay, so this is denoted d free. D free is what? Five. Okay, in above example. Okay, simple enough. Okay. so in in reality today you don't have to bother so much because so uh, because all these issues of d free have already been solved in the in the sense that suppose you have to design a 32 state convolutional code suppose you figure out that in your decoder you can decode a 32 state convolutional code right that's the complexity right that's what fixes how many states you can handle okay then then the next thing is rate okay what rate can you tolerate maybe there are other things which tell you how how low or how high a rate you can go okay usually it's depend on things called dependent on things called bandwidth efficiency etc etc all these things spectral efficiency become important so some something might determine your rate okay maybe rate one half okay suppose i want to find the best rate half 32 state convolutional encoder okay suppose that is your that is the definition okay so it's a simple search problem right you you go to g of d okay assume all possible uh polynomials right how many are there how many are possible if i say i need 32 states d par 5 d par 5 should be there okay and then the remaining things 4 plus 4 8 bits up maximum of 256 okay maybe actually lesser maybe many of them are equal okay but still let's say 256 so you'll search through all of them find d free for each of them pick the one with the best d free okay so that's the logic and people have done this already Okay, so today you can look at look in the books and find the best rate half convolutional code out there for a particular uh, number of states. Okay, so that's why these things are not so critical today. The structural properties not very critical. Okay, and the search space is also quite small. Okay, it's very unlikely that you will ever de design a 50 state con 50 what 2 par 50 state convolutional encoder. Okay, so it's very unlikely that you'll be able to decode it. Okay, so one in fact one can do it, but it's all very difficult okay so the search space will always be very very small and you can go through all of them and find the d free and finish it okay so that's the that's why i said it's not so critical that you know this today but uh, but you should know these terms okay? because people will talk about these terms often okay? people will say free distance is the best free distance etc okay so so that is one such uh, one such thing but one more thing you should realize because of that linear time invariant property for the convolutional codes what will happen if you have a feed forward convolutional code what will happen there will be how many such
code words will I have? I'll have several. Every time I keep shifting it, as as my k increases, this will increase linearly with k. Okay, so the number of such minimum weight uh, error events will be fairly large in a convolutional code. Okay, so the, those are observations we made even in the turbo code scenario. Okay, another thing you'll see is when your SNR is reasonably high, okay, your convolutional code is very likely to make a string of errors. Okay, right? The reason is once it starts making an error, it will make an error for a while and then it will rejoin, rejoin the all zero state and not make the errors anymore. Okay, so one can one can say this with based on experience or based on intuition also that at moderately high SNRs, okay. Errors uh, will be in bursts. Okay, that's the that's the technical way of putting it. Okay, so you make an error, you'll you'll go wrong for a while in a burst, and then you'll come back again, and you'll be uh, in in the all zero state, and you'll maybe make an error once again, go go back and join. So that's something like that will happen typically for in moderately high SNR. Very high SNRs, of course, there won't be too many errors. Very low SNRs, there'll be all kinds of errors. But moderate SNRs, where you really want to operate, something like this will happen. You'll see there's a way of taking advantage of this pro property later on. Okay, so I'll try to remember this property at least for, till the end of this lecture. Okay, so eventually later on, I'll uh, I'll call upon this. Okay, so I think with this we'll uh, say goodbye to convolutional codes and turbo codes and all that. Maybe we'll come back and uh, see that in the homework a little bit. Okay, so this is the uh, okay. All right, so. Yes, yes. What is catastrophic error propagation? So, so it's it's actually not a property of the code. Okay, being catastrophic is a property of the encoder. Okay, so if you have uh, okay, so for instance, uh, maybe maybe I should give you an example. If you have a G of T, okay, this is to explain catastrophe. If you have, for instance, G of D equals, maybe the example I've been citing is catastrophic. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. It's not maybe. If you have, say, 1 plus D times D, and then 1 plus D times 1 plus D, say if this is your encoder, okay. So what will happen if I put u of d equals 1 by 1 plus d? Okay, what is weight of u? Okay, think of it as an infinite sequence. What is 1 by 1, 1 by 1 plus d? What is the actual sequence? 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 forever, right? So that is, is actually infinite. Okay, what about the output? d. 1 plus d and weight of u is weight of v is 3 okay a situation like this is said to be catastrophic okay if your encoder is such that something like this can happen for an infinite length input if you get a finite length output uh, your encoder is supposed to be catastrophic for the same convolutional code you can have a non catastrophic encoder also you just pull the 1 plus d out and do d 1 plus d that won't happen so when will catastrophe happen? All these things, the G, the GDs, the impulse responses, should have a common GCD, right? When you factor it out, this one plus D should be there. Okay, so GCD should be non-trivial. So be something, some common factor should be there. Okay, then catastrophe can happen. Whereas catastrophe will not happen. Okay, but for the same code, there can be catastrophic encoders as well as non-catastrophic encoders, and you better pick the non-catastrophic <laughs> encoder. Okay, so something like this is probably not very nice. When you go from a block error rate to bit error rate conversion, it can cause all kinds of confusion. Okay. Anything else? It's fine. There's also a whole bunch of decoders called stack decoders for convolutional codes. You might be interested in that. And uh, the claim is that high SNRs, sufficiently high SNRs, the complexity of the stack encoder is is not even exponential in the number of states. It's lesser than that. So if you have really long, really large number of states, stack decoders are, can be used. Okay, so that's another area 
which have not uh, spent time. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much an end for the convolutional codes and turbo codes. Uh, maybe, maybe not the end for trellises. Okay, so the one last thing I want to point out before I leave these trellises for good is this notion of trellis for block codes. Okay, so so far, so far we've always thought about trellises for convolutional code. Can you have a graph? Okay, so what do I mean by a trellis? What was a trellis? Trellis is a graph, right? You have a nodes and a bunch of branches connecting. What was the connection between the trellis and the code? Code. Every code word was represented as a path in my trellis. Okay. So for a block code, how did we define block codes using generator matrices, parity check matrices, right? For a block code, can you come up with a trellis? Is a question that one might ask. Okay. So what's the point in coming up with a trellis for a block code? What's the advantage? Yeah, the ML decoding and MAP decoding are there. Right? So far, for block codes, we never really had a, any implementation which claims to be better for ML or MAP, implementable for ML or MAP, right? We never had that. Okay? So if you come up with, yeah, if you come up with a uh, trellis representation for the block codes, maybe one can run Viterbi on it okay? or the MAP decoder on it and do your decoding for your block code also. So there's some advantage in doing that. Okay? So the question is, can you come up with anything like a trellis for the block code. Second thing is how many states will it have, right? That's also an important thing. If it ends up having a huge number of states, then it is maybe maybe that's also not very efficient. Okay. So so I'm going to once again do this by example. I'll take an example for the Hamming code and show you how to construct a maybe a smaller code than the Hamming code and show you how to construct the uh, trellis for it. It's very simple actually. We'll we'll see one construction based on the parity check matrix. There's also several other constructions available. Okay. So here's an example. I'll take a 633 code. Okay. With parity check matrix. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, let's we'll see this explanation. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> So it's very, uh, this is rate half. Huh? This is rate half. yeah, this is rate half. Let, let's see this example and then I'll come back to it. The question was, can you have such trellises for all rates? Because for, for convolutional codes, we saw only trellises for 1 by uh, 2 and 1 by 3 and all that. Actually, even for convolutional codes with 2 by 3, you can have a trellis. It's possible. I'm sorry? Yeah, so far I've been saying puncturing is the idea, but even if you don't want to puncture, you can have two input streams and you'll have four branches out of each state. It's possible. Okay. All right. So the parity check matrix I'm going to take is very simple. I'll take 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. You can check that all these parameters I've been talking about are true. Okay. 6, 3, 3 is true. Okay. Then I'm going to draw a uh, trellis for this. Okay. So what do I know about every code word of my code? What does it satisfy? It satisfies H times C transpose is 0. Okay. Let me try to write this equation in a slightly different way, which possibly which will possibly give me the the what? The trellis. Okay, so remember what are the bits associated with each column? Where will I put the parity bits? Where will I put the message bits? Last three columns of the mess are the message bits. How many of you say last three columns are the message bits? No, last three columns are the parity bits, right? So the first three columns are the message bits. So we'll say M1, M2, M3, P1, P2, P3. So what can you pick? You can pick M1 and M2 and M3 to be arbitrary bits. P1, P2, P3 will get fixed by M1, M2, M3, right? See, this is a different kind of a I'm sorry. Is yeah, yeah, this is my choice for this. Yeah, yeah. If you have something else, yeah, yeah. Okay, the question is, are this, is this the only choice for message and parity? Yeah, there are other choices also, but the way I drew, right, wrote down my parity, parity check matrix, this is the most obvious choice. Okay, because anything else will involve some confusion. Okay, all right. 
so in the convolution codes things work differently right you could pick the message bits up to any distance you want and after that what do you do you drive back to the all zero state so here also you should do something similar right but you are allowed to pick only the first three bits and the remaining three bits will get picked so that ultimately some all zero state should happen okay some such thing has to result okay so i'll see how to do that with this hc transpose okay so what's happening let me write that down fully my parity check matrix is 1 1 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 0 0 0 1 okay multiplied with m1 m2 m3 p1 p2 p3 equals what 0 0 0 this is a condition i know that has to hold okay so i'll write this product in a slightly different way i'll say this is m1 times 1 1 0 plus m2 times 0 1 1 plus m3 times 1 0 1 plus p1 times 1 0 0 plus p2 times 0 1 0 plus p3 times 0 0 1 equals what equals 0 0 0 okay so i'm going to think of a finite state machine whose inputs are okay it's at a particular state okay okay so i'm going to think of finite state machine which is in some state it takes input m1 and goes to some state then it takes input m2 it goes to some other state goes takes another input m3 it goes to some other state after that what should happen after that p1 p2 p3 should be input so that it comes back to the all zero state okay so initially it was in the all zero state it comes back to the all zero state okay since i want that and if you start at this equation for a while a very natural way of assigning the state is to say right right i start with 0 0 0 as my all zero state after i input m1 what should become my state m1 times 1 1 0 okay after i input m2 what should be my stage m1 times 1 1 0 plus m2 times 0 1 1 after i input m3 what should be the state m1 times 1 1 0 plus m2 times 1 0 1 1 plus m3 times 1 0 1 okay and then then what happens after that p1 p2 and p3 will be decided you will know what p1 p2 and p3 should be so that you will go back to the all zero state but at every time what is the actual state after p1 what is the state the sum from left to p1 okay so that's a very natural way of defining states and transitions so that's what i'm going to do and then draw a trellis okay so we'll see the trellis is also very very easy to come up with so i am at all zero state initially okay my input is m1 okay if my m1 is 0 where do i go okay i remain at all zero state okay so maybe maybe this is a clumsy way of drawing the state so i'll i'll do one thing i'm sorry I'll draw the state and, and write the state inside it. I think that is a very easy way of doing it. 0, 0, 0. Okay. If my M1 is 0, I remain at 0, 0, 0. If my M1 is 1, where do I go? I go to 1, 1, 0. Okay. And then again, there are two possibilities, right? So if I'm at 0, this will always happen. Okay, if I'm at one, what will happen? If I if I, if I get an input one for M two, what will happen? Zero. I'll go to one zero one, right? So remember that. If I go to one, I'll go to no zero one one, right? Okay. Zero one one. I'm sorry. Okay, here if you get one as an input, what will happen? Zero as an input, what will happen? You'll remain at one one zero. If you get one as an input, what will happen? you go to 101 okay so that's what happens so you see it's not right it's not as easy as drawing a trellis for the convolutional codes because the states differ and the same transitions don't remain the same okay so some things change okay and it's very it's a little bit confusing to draw trellises for block codes but the definition at least is simple enough okay and then the next uh, next stage is once again repeated okay so for zeros input you go to 0 0 0 if 1 is the input you go to 1 0 1 okay so I'm going to have some confusion here so let me draw that here 0 is the input time here I put 0 1 1 here input 
one one zero here this is zero this is also zero am i right so any time when zero is an input you continue to remain at the same state okay so that's the only thing you can say this constant what happens when one is an input in each of these cases you have to add 101 okay so you will go to 110 if if one is an input am i right okay what will happen if one is an input here you go to 011 do you agree okay and then if one is an input here what will happen you will go back to 00 I'm sorry. Yeah. So from here now you drive back to the all zero state. Okay, and that's very clear what to do also, right? You'll have to do zero one one from here, one one zero from here, and one zero one from here. Okay. So you do that, you would get uh, you would get what? This guy goes to zero zero zero. This guy goes to zero zero zero. Finally, you end up in zero zero zero. Okay, so here you go to zero 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 and go to zero one one with one. You go to zero zero one, and then with one you go to zero zero zero. Okay, so make sure I'm doing it correctly. Go back and. Think about that. With one, you go to zero one zero, and with one, you go to zero zero zero. Right. So here you go with one two zero zero one, and uh, zero two zero zero one. Okay. So I got to this carefully. Zero to zero zero one, and then one two. Okay, so that's my trellis for the block code. Okay, that's all. Trellis for six six. Okay, one can make a lot of interesting observations. Okay, so based on my definition, since I had three bits for my state, one might expect I have a Eight state trellis. Okay, so actually all the eight states occur. Do they occur? There's one state which doesn't occur, right? One 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 never occurs, right? Yeah, I'll come back to that slowly. Okay, so you you see one 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 never occurs here. Okay, but all the other states occur, right? Zero zero one occurs, zero one zero occurs, zero one one occurs, one zero zero occurs. No, one zero zero also doesn't occur, right? Yeah, you never go to the one zero zero. state also okay and at any given time how many states do you have maximum four okay so which is a little bit surprising okay that's the that's the first uh, comment i want to make okay? it's a little bit surprising okay and all this happened because i chose my ms very carefully you know i mean i put the ms in the careful place if i change my parity check matrix this will change okay you know every code has several parity check matrices right you pick any three any any set of n minus k linearly independent vectors from the dual code you get a parity check matrix if you change the parity check matrix the trellis will completely change okay so for instance one problem that you could pose is to find for a given code the best parity check matrix which will give you the lowest number of states in your trellis okay 2 par n minus k one can always achieve okay if you want a trellis with say 2 par n minus k states one can easily get it right that's what that's what i told you will give you that but if you want less than that maybe there is a possibility okay but all these problems don't are not really open or unsolved or anything okay in fact very recent work people have shown that finding the least complexity trellis for a linear block code is So what's called NP hard, which means it's a very difficult problem. So, okay, people have shown all these. Things. So it's, these things are tough to, tough to find. Okay, so so you won't find many implementations of soft decoders for block codes based on 
trellises uh, out, out there in reality okay so it's not very practical but it's a useful thing to know that you can have a trellis like this and in case if you have a very short code and you want to do a soft decoder you can use this okay for the 633 code this is a very eminently implementable thing okay that's one thing and uh, what else I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say about trellis. Okay, so one can do different trellises and one can do soft decoders for block codes this way also. Okay, it's a brief count. Never do decode. The outputs are it's the same. What I've written is the output. So it's you can write zero stroke zero, zero stroke zero if you want. Input and the output are the same. Okay. So you can imagine zero being the input and zero being the output. No, you have a state diagram. You can have a state diagram. You know. Oh yeah, it will change. Yeah, exactly. So this is like a straight diagram. <laughs> it it's a com slightly complicated notion. Yeah. Okay. So. So, 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 it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all I want to say. Okay. So next, uh, next notion that, uh, that one needs in practice, in practice, you'll see people use, uh, several ideas, which, which give you some minor benefits over, uh, over in, in, in terms of actual design and actual practice. Okay. So uh, one such thing, which gives a lot of benefit in practice in terms of complexity and in terms of being able to implement things and even in terms of performance is this notion of concatenation. Okay, so I have not spoken much about it but concatenation is a very very uh, powerful idea which is used which is used in many systems. Most systems that are out there today use some concatenation. Okay, basically instead of doing one whole code split split the coding duty into several smaller blocks. Okay, So I will make a few comments about concatenation basically pointing out some important ways of concatenating things and things to watch out for and things to be careful about okay so one method which is very very popular is introduced introduced to the original concatenation methods it's the following i don't know how practical it is i don't know but it's a it's a useful way of coming up with large minimum distance codes from smaller minimum distance codes okay so this is how the concatenation works so whenever you concatenate you put one thing after the other okay so this is what you do you take You take an n1 comma k1 code over gf 2 power k2. Okay. Okay. Some k2. I take an n1 comma k1. Okay. Maybe I, I should do a d1 also. Just put down. Uh, okay. So I can do this, right? You can imagine a Reed Solomon code, a shortened Reed Solomon code, if you will, okay, over g of 2 power 8. Then I can always do this. I can do an n1 comma k1 comma d1 code. Okay, so how many bits will I have here? How many symbols will I have here? At the input to this block, k1 symbols over g of 2 power k2. So how many bits is that? K1 times k2 bits do you agree you will have k1 k2 bits right that's what you'd be encoding so then I'm sorry is there a question so what what will be the output n1 k2 right so basically uh, n1 k2 bits so I'll, I'll write n1 symbols I'll write k1 symbols here n1 k2 bits so you take each symbol which is actually k2 bits and then further encode that with a n2 k2 d2 binary code okay so what I'm going to apply here is a, the same k2 yeah n2 k2 d2 binary code okay so so remember you have n1 times k2 coming in here right each set of k2 bits 
which correspond to one symbol over g of 2 power k2 i'm going to encode further with a n2 k2 d2 code okay so what what will i get outside n1 n2 bits okay okay so this is one of the most one of the original ideas of concatenation okay so i believe they were introduced by forney for this concatenation maybe somebody else introduced it it's also introduced by him and he studied this in great detail okay so so overall overall what 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 code is this this an n1 n2 comma k1 k2 can i say it's a linear code in terms of bits so assuming all these codes inside are linear can i say the overall code will be linear from from k1 k2 bits to n1 n2 bits just shake your head and say yeah how do you prove something like this yeah yeah maybe maybe some such thing you can do but instead of doing g1 g2 and all that so basically you, you take a code word c1 okay and then you take another code word c2 assume systematic encoding okay one can easily show that when you add these two when you add the two symbols when you add two symbols in gf2 par k2 what are you doing you are actually doing binary xor right in the in the binary representation so it will also happen uh, the the xor addition in in the in over gf2 par k2 will become addition in binary also so the overall code n1 n2 comma k1 k2 code one can show is a linear code linear binary code what is surprising and interesting is one can show this is in fact a n1 n2 comma k1 k2 comma d1 d2 code Okay, so how do you prove the d1 d2 property? Why do the minimum distances multiply? Symbols multiply and corresponding Yeah, so that's the thing. Once you know it's a linear code, only thing you have to worry about is find the code word of minimum weight. Okay, so suppose you take any code word. Okay, any code word or a non-zero code word at the output here, it will correspond to a non-zero code word. at the output of the first first code itself that non zero code word will have at least d1 non zero symbols okay it will have at least d1 non zero symbols each of these non zero symbols has to be encoded by the second code into a non zero code word again and each of those code words contain d2 bits so d1 times d2 bits must be present in every non zero code word and you get a d1 d2 multiplication okay so it's a very interesting way of doing uh, concatenation yeah greater than or equal to is right okay so to be very strict it's greater than or equal to in many cases when you can concatenate it will be equal to in some cases it might it might actually be greater okay, so it can happen if you choose your codes carefully you can concatenate okay so this is a very good idea in for getting good codes when you say good i mean the d by n should should not vanish when k by n is kept a constant and you tend n to a large number so you can actually design good codes using this concatenation idea okay so good codes can be designed well good codes will be good so if you can decode them it's okay a possible by above method uh, yeah let me come to that slowly okay so 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 good codes are possible what are the advantage do you think this concatenation gives you so for instance this question was why can't i just construct a read solomon code for the larger block length yeah this will be simple because you can get away with a smaller uh, uh, smaller galois field size maybe so so many other things are possible maybe some something else is also uh, maybe some maybe there are some other simplifications as well but but at least one can imagine a smaller Field size for the Galois field. Okay, but how will you decode this guy? Ah, is that good enough? What do you mean by decode first the outer code and then the inner code? Is that good enough? Think carefully about how will you decode. It's not that trivial to decode because the outer code when you decode you can only correct how many errors? D two minus one by two. 
Okay, it's got only D2. D1, D2 will not naturally come just because you concatenated like this. Okay, then when you pass it on, so many things could have gone wrong and you may not be able to correct errors. Okay, so while you can encode in multiple stages, the only thing that will recover the entire decoding property is if you do join decoding. Okay, if you do individual decoding, you may not be able to get back your full D1, D2 minus 1 by 2. Okay, you have to be you have to think about it. There are some possibilities here. There are some multi-stage decoders possible, but decoding is not straightforward. Okay, if you want to get your full decoding capability, if you want to do something suboptimal, that's fine. But if you want to get your full D1, D2 minus 1 by 2, then join decoding is necessary. You can't do uh, single uh, decoding. Okay, so decoding problem, decoding is not solved. Okay? Decoding is still a problem. Okay, decoding up to D1, D2 minus 1 by 2 remains a problem. You don't really achieve any simplification there. Maybe in some special cases you will, but not necessarily always. Okay, so this is the this is one way of uh, concatenation. So this is part one in concatenation, and concatenation is done for so many other reasons. This is not the only reason for concatenation. This is not the only way of concatenating things, and in practice, actually, you'll find very few systems which actually use this kind of concatenation. Okay, so one concat another concatenation which is actually more popular in practice, and it was used still a short while ago before being replaced by another way of concatenation. So <laughs> see, concatenation methods keep changing over time. Okay, so this is the second thing that we are going to see is called the reed solomon Witterby concatenation. Okay, RSV is what I will call it. Actually, I should say reed solomon convolutional code. Okay, so but it is usually in practice people say reed solomon Witterby. Okay, so when you say Witterby code, it means convolutional code. Okay, it is understood that we always use Witterby decoder with convolutional codes. Okay, so the idea here is very, very simple. The concatenation works as follows. You put a RS code outside, maybe over GF256, then you put a convolutional code inside. Okay, that's all. Okay, and then it goes through the channel. Then how do you decode? You put Viterbi here, and then you put, say, your uh, PGC decode. How many of you remember the expansion for PGZ? Okay, I'm going to give one grade more for anyone who can say it right now. Uh -huh. uh, you don't, don't look back in your notes. <laughs> anyway, so it doesn't matter. The bounded distance decoder that we saw in class. Okay, so you do that. This is a very popular idea. In fact, in, in many of the some of the space space shuttles that were launched, not space shuttles, some of these uh, deep uh, in the distant planet exploration. Uh, uh, so satellites that went out this was the combination that was used okay so the idea is here once again the burst error property of these Viterbi decoders okay so you know convolutional codes one can do ml decoding okay so you can do optimal decoding and reed solomon codes help you correct bursts of errors very easily so you put a convolutional code and then one day error you get you'll get outside of your Viterbi will be hopefully bursts at moderate snrs and you can pick them up and correct them with your reed solomon code Okay, so you will see this actually gives you a benefit. If you do a BR versus EB over N0 plot, you will see the slope of the curve will sharply decrease when you do this concatenation. It just goes down very fast. Okay, so this was this was a popular idea for satellite communications till it got replaced by the product concatenation or the turbo product code, which is actually now becoming more popular in many places. Okay, so what is the turbo idea, turbo product code idea? No, no, no. None of the... See, any any time you do a multi-stage decoder, the question was, is the decoding like this optimal? Okay, clearly it's not optimal if you take a, take the total code because the total code will be something else. And you're doing stage-wise decoding, but this decoding is practical, can be implemented and can be done. Okay, so these turbo product codes have replaced uh, Reed Solomon Viterbi in several places, and in fact, even in the system that we have here, how many of you know we actually have a satellite communication system in this very building? Okay, so in that system. The Reed Solomon VTB was replaced by a turbo product code, and this performs much better. Okay, so the word turbo is there, right? So obviously it should be better. But before we talk about the turbo, we'll talk about what the product construction is. This is again a very interesting construction. Okay, so who's doing turbo product? Who you're doing? No? Okay, so maybe maybe when he does it, this is like a prelude for uh, what he talks. But I'll only talk about the product code. Maybe the turbo part you can pick up. In. 
there. Okay. So here, what you do is you think of your message as a as a matrix instead of a vector. Okay. So you take a k1 by k2 uh, matrix. Okay. So your message length is k1 k2 bits. Okay. And then you have two generator matrices. G1 is a k1 by n1 generator matrix. And G2 is a k2 by n2 generator matrix. What you do is each row of M you encode with G2. Okay, see each row of M is what? How many bits is that? K2 bits. Okay, so I can multiply by G2 on the right. Okay, that is a valid multiplication. So to form a code word C, I'm going to take M and multiply with G2 on the right. Okay, and then each column of MG2, okay, I will encode with the the code corresponding to G1. So when I do column, what should I do? I should multiply by transpose on the left. Okay, so I'll write G1 transpose. This is how I form my code word. So what will be the dimensions of C? N1 by N2. Okay, that's a very simple idea. So the overall code is a N1, N2, comma, K1, K2 code. That's also very clear. It's also very clear that it's linear. Okay, so it's very clear from this multiplication thing. You do M1 plus M2, you will get this. Okay, right? And it's also from the associativity property of matrix multiplication. You know, it doesn't matter whether you encode the row first or the column first. You will ultimately get the same product. Okay, so you can either do the G1 transpose M first and then multiply by G2 on the right, or mg2 first and then multiply by g1 transpose on the left you will get the exact same code word matrix and that's that's also very nice to know so you don't have to worry about whether you do the row first or the column first or what will change and what will not change okay all these things are fine now suppose i say d1 is the minimum distance for the code corresponding to g1 and d2 is the minimum distance for the code corresponding to g2 can you bound the minimum distance for the overall code Suppose the demon is D1 here and the demon is D2 here, what can you say? Think about it. So in the final matrix C, can I say each row will be a code word of the code C1 corresponding to G1? Yeah. Likewise, every column will be a code word of G1. I'm sorry, every row will be a code word of G2. Okay. So that's the important observation. In C, okay, which is actually a n1 by n2 matrix every row is a code word of g2 and every column is a code word of g1 right that's how the matrix multiplication worked out okay so so now think about it can we bound the minimum distance based on minimum distance of this thing. Okay, actually the bound is D1, D2 once again. Okay, how do you get, how do you get that D1, D2? <laughs> yeah, if you have a non-zero matrix, there should be at least one row which has a, which is non-zero. Okay, and that non-zero row should have at least D2 once. So go to those D2 columns. All of them are non-zero. So each of those columns should have at least D1 once. So overall, the minimum weight for every non-zero code word will have to be D1 times D2 at least. Is that clear? Okay. So that's how you get a bound for. It can be exactly D1, D2, but it can be greater also, greater than or equal. What I'm saying is, suppose all the rows are code words, all the columns are also code words. Oh, if I pick, uh, I don't know. I don't think you'll get the same number, no. See here, in this way, I get only two par k1, k2 code words. If you do that, how many will you get? If you do what you're saying. Okay, let's talk about this after class. Okay, his question is if you do some other division. So this, that's not what I want. Okay, so here the minimum distance is greater than or equal to d1, d2. 
okay so the argument i gave you is straight i'm not going to write it down but hopefully you remember that so the overall code becomes n1 n2 k1 k2 greater than or equal to d1 d2 okay so so I, if there's some confusion about what you asked me i'll come back and tell you okay so this is fine okay so this seems like a good construction so once again when you think about decoding there'll be problems because see suppose you want to achieve the whole full d1 d2 minus 1 by 2 correcting capability you cannot decode columns and rows independently right if you do that we can only do d1 but the main advantage in complexity is you're thinking of columns and rows which are much smaller codes than the entire larger code which you may be which you have difficulty in decoding okay so the advantage in this construction was you constructed a larger code with larger minimum distance using smaller codes which have smaller minimum distance for instance the standard choice is you pick uh, c1 and c2 to be extended hamming codes this is a very very popular choice extended hamming codes so for instance uh, the choice that's been that was made for the decoder uh, for the code for this satellite modem that's out here in this building is basically we use the 64 57 4 extended hamming code okay so extended hamming code for 63 57 3 is the hamming code 64 57 4 would be the extended hamming code okay so if you use both of them as hamming codes what's the overall dimension 64 times 64 is 1496 comma 57 by 50 times 57 comma 16 okay greater than or equal to 16 so how many errors can i potentially correct them minimum distance is 16 so seven seven errors can be potentially corrected okay but if you want to achieve that full error correcting capability you'll have to decode the whole code word as a whole okay so that might be difficult so the suboptimal decoders are basically decoders that do one row at a time and one column at a time and somehow put together and get a overall decoding okay so that's where the turbo product code idea comes in and how you iterate between these things and all that all that uh, is useful okay I don't know you tell me <laughs> so the question is is, uh, is the turbo product code different from the first concatenation we had yeah I believe so I mean at least we have we have only binary codes here right we are not thinking about them as codes over extended alphabets only binary okay so and in practice you see turbo product codes will be much better than the reed solomon Viterbi in terms of complexity in terms of everything it's just it works it just works way better okay so that's uh, that's one idea okay so oh my god getting close to ending time so yeah there's one more type of so sometimes <coughs> so, 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 so so several other concatenations one can do you know one can just take a uh, say for instance a 50 comma 100 code binary then concatenate it with a 100 comma 200 code you know i mean you can just do it you know, no don't worry about it but you won't have any such any such nice distance properties this d1 d2 multiplication came only for those two constructions and it's difficult to do any other concatenation which will give you the d1 d2 distance multiplication property but it doesn't matter one can do it there are so many other advantages for doing uh, these kind of uh, smaller uh, divisions okay so for instance if you go back and look at uh, uh, reed solomon codes itself one of the earliest systems to use reed solomon codes on cd drives and all that they they really use uh, heavily shortened codes in concatenation okay so you might say why they wanted to concatenate and all that but the motivation there is to simplify your decoding right even though you have uh, nothing better to do so so I'll, I'll i'll put that down as concatenation idea four but it's not really a major idea so this is, this is just an example so the first code you have is a 28 24 5 okay this is rs code over gf256 Okay, so what so this is obviously a heavily shortened code shortened from where what is the primitive code which was used to shorten this what's the dimensions of the primitive code with the same error correcting capability 5 
Okay, let me post the question differently. Suppose I want to correct, uh, design a two error correcting Reed Solomon code over GF256. What will be its dimensions? What is the block length? What is the block length that I gave in class for Reed Solomon codes? Some ballpark figure. Was it 1? Was it 2? Was it 10? What was it? Block length that I used in class for primitive Reed Solomon codes. What was the block length? I don't know. I think many of you know the answer. Just throw it out. I want to hear it. This is Reed Solomon, man. There's no BCH and all. This is Reed Solomon. What is the block length? Block length over GF256 in terms of symbols. What was it? Okay, I think at this point I'm not going to stop anymore. It's 255. Okay, 255 symbols. Okay, and then how many? What is the? What is K? For for correcting two errors, how much? How many should you do? N comma N minus. Two t, right? Two t. Okay. So for every, so if you want a minimum distance five, you have to have four consecutive roots. So you add n minus two t. Okay. So 255, 251, five code was the original primitive code. From there you shorten down to 28, 24. You set a whole bunch of messages to zero. Okay. Right. That's what you do to get this 28, 24, five. Solomon code over GF 256. Okay. So in one of the CD standards, one of the earliest CD standards, they do this concatenation. Well, there is there are several other blocks in the middle. Okay, so for instance, uh, you might want to take say 28 times 24 symbols. Okay, symbols are bytes, right? So you take bytes here. Okay, what what will you get here? Okay, you encode them 24 bytes at a time into 28 bytes. So you will get here 28 by 28 bytes. Okay, so then what you do is you do a row column interleave. Okay, what do I mean by a row column interleave? Yeah, so you put them, you stack these code words one row at a time and then you output the columns okay right so you you do a row column interleaving okay so these these things get say when they go in they are going to go in like this okay one at a time and when they come out which will come out first this guy will come out first okay so across code words will come out first okay and then what you do is you send it through a 32 28 5 RS code over GF256. So, what was the original primitive code for this? The 32, 28, 5? The same 255, 251, 5 code, but it was shortened to a slightly lesser degree. Few lesser message bits were set to, message symbols were set to 0. You did that. Okay. You did, if you do this, what will you get finally? 32 times 28 bytes. Okay. So finally, out of this 32 times 28 bytes, what will be the property? What can we say will actually happen? Assuming you're doing systematic encoding. Okay. Assuming you're doing systematic encoding, what will happen? You initially had a 24 by 24, which was, no, 28 by 24, no? Okay. 28 by 24 which was your message and then you encoded what each row okay each row was encoded to get a code word of 2824 5 code okay and then what happened each column was encoded to get a what code word of 32, 28, 5. Okay, so this is how it will look. Okay, so 
so here i don't know i mean linearity and all that is maybe relevant maybe irrelevant and even minimum distance will not really grow as 5 times 5 you can't expect 5 times 5 years. okay so it did not work so ni as nicely as uh, we had before right so i don't know i don't know maybe it's difficult to think of difficult for me to think of linear dis uh, minimum distance here because we have an interleaving and i don't know what's going to happen right i don't know maybe, maybe one can argue for some minimum distance here okay so think about it think about how you would argue for minimum distance in a construction like this okay so that's that's something else but that's not relevant because uh, in the decoder what was done was these things were decoded independently stage by stage okay so you decode the outer code first basically you decode the columns first and then you decode the rows okay so you get some benefit by that but it's not a product construction or not a very good uh, uh, other construction either. okay so one can do this also so this was used in one of the early cd standards okay so the primary problem if you think about it remember the, the code words went out a column at a time right so one of the primary problems in cds is scratches right you are worried about a sequence of bits going wrong and then you have to recover this kind of a construction is excellent for scratches when you do this row column interleaving okay if you get a series of errors what will happen if an entire column here gets erased what will happen look at it yeah only one error in each row if two columns get erased what happens so only one error in each row okay so that's the that's the most uh, nice thing about something like this okay so that's why this row column interleaving gives you a lot of protection against burst uh, uh, burst errors and cds this is a very common thing interleaving is very very common even on hard drives where the people where people use uh, Reed solomon codes interleaving is very very common interleaving across code words in a row column fashion will always give you an improvement in burst erasure burst error correcting capability okay so yeah second part gives you more more protection against random errors no actually what the, what they did in the cd standard was very interesting they would uh, see how do you know the entire thing is getting erased for, for instance how do you know how do you detect a burst right you could have some electronics which figures out if the whole thing there is a scratch or not etc you monitor some other signal and figure out maybe it's possible but purely from a coding point of view if you don't if you're not allowed to use any other signal how can you find out if there is a if there's a burst of error or not if there's a cra scratch or not so yeah maybe, maybe they didn't even do things like that they were saying if the outer code fails i will declare the entire column as gone you know i'll declare that there was a scratch every time the outer code fails Re remember reach solomon code will fail right if there is a lot of errors and that's very likely to happen and since if the outer code fails they'll declare actually that the whole column was erased so some such thing they did you know i mean so some very simple idea like that to even detect the burst and it, was, it came out in the 80s this first cd standard you know, i think cds were not that popular before the 80s i guess many of you may not know these things but See, see, the series came out. This was one of the first standards. To come. So the outer code also plays the role of detecting when errors happen. So all these things can be used in engineering solutions. All these other things are important. When it finally becomes a product. These kind of things play much more important role than being able to do something else. Okay. All right. So this is uh, this is a very good place to stop. There's one more minor thing which I actually wanted to talk about. And uh, do we have time? We have like 10 minutes. Left. So let me just finish off with that. Okay. So the last bit which I want you to leave with is, is uh, so so far we've only talked about BPSK. Right? BPSK. I mean, if you do QPSK, it's a very minor extension of BPSK. Right? In two coordinates, this basically QPSK can be seen as BPSK, except that spectral efficiency goes up by. Two. Okay. So. So not, none of your coding ideas and your LDPC or turbo codes, none of the design has to change when you go from BPSK to QPSK. But when you go from go to 16QAM or 8PSK or some such genuinely different const constellation, then how do you get LLRs is an important question. Okay, how did we get LLRs for BPSK and QPSK? 2R by sigma square. It was a very simple formula, right? But when you do 16QAM or say 8 for 4PAM, okay, then 
there are too many bits involved you don't know how to do you should know how to do llr okay so that that's one that's one point okay so 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 that's that's the last bit that i'm going to leave you with uh, basically coded modulation so how do you do higher order modulations to achieve higher spectral efficiency so why would you want to do 16 qam okay you being more spectrally efficient no the same bandwidth you can do four bits while you are doing only one bit and two bit with bpsk and qpsk when you do 16 qam you are doing four bits in the same bandwidth but what do you need to be able to do 16 qam is enough you need obviously higher is enough you remember the capacity curves that i plot plotted we able to do anything with uh, 16 qam you need higher is enough so if you have higher snr and you have limited bandwidth you will have to go to larger constellation sizes and when you go to larger constellation sizes you have to pay attention to coded modulation okay so there's there's coded modulation with convolutional codes called trellis coded modulation okay so we will not see that we will just see for block codes and how to go about doing it okay so one idea that might become more practical maybe not the optimal way of doing coded modulation but what might become very practical is the following you might do some block code here okay imagine an ldpc code okay because you want to do soft decoding so maybe an ldpc code okay and then you have your what i'll call as a mapper what does the mapper do in bpsk we had a mapper right what does the bpsk mapper do take 0 to plus 1 1 to minus 1 for 16 qam obviously the mapper is more complex it will take four bits to a 16 qam symbol which will be actually a complex number so we think about it a plus ib where a is 1 minus 1 3 minus 3 and b is also 1 minus 1 3 minus 3 so so we think about it that that's the that's the constellation so the mapper does that okay i do it in some way usually one of the mappings which is very common in practice is called what's called the gray mapping you might be familiar with it any two things differ so some such mapper so maybe gray okay think of it as gray okay and then what happens it goes through say awgm Okay, so what's becoming much more common today is the fading channel type scenario, right? So today, all these things are being done with wireless. So wireless is the main non-trivial problem. If you have a channel which is static and it stays the same, people know how to deal with it. So, so maybe, maybe this this needs to be replaced by some fading channel. And when when you do fading, etc., people find it useful to put an interleaver here. Okay, so I'll just I'll write a pi here and put a box around it. Maybe you have an interleaver in between your code word and the mapping. Okay, so that's very that's also a popular idea. You'll see in the decoder we can use these things. It's, it's it's quite easy to do these things. So now at the decoding end, what do you do? The first thing you do is demapping. But remember, you can't do a hard demapper. You can't just decide on the bits. You have to decide on LLRs. Okay, so the output of the demapper is LLRs channel LLRs okay and for 16 QAM etc finding LLRs is not as easy as finding LLRs for BPSK right if you take one bit in 16 QAM it will be zero for how many signal points in 16 QAM eight right eight of the points will be zero eight of the points will be one and each of them will correspond to different actual signal that was transmitted <laughs> So you have to do a lot of conditioning, you will get a lot of expressions in the numerator, a lot of expressions in the denominator, it will be a nasty function which will not simplify. Okay? So there are approximations for that, there are changes possible, but in general this demapper will be more complicated for higher order constellations. Okay? But the demapper will output LLRs and then you do what? You do a pi inverse and then do a say a soft decoder, soft in soft out decoder. Okay, this this kind of a structure is becoming very very popular these days. People are talking about it. It's a very at least lot of lot of implementations today for wireless systems and all of people are proposing things like this. Okay, so some such idea is becoming very very popular. And and in fact, what people are suggesting is, anytime you have different blocks like this and each of them are soft processing, what can you do? You can subtract out intrinsic extrinsic and do turbo iterations. Remember this demapper, what does it do? It takes soft value in and produces soft value out. What does the decoder do? It takes soft values in and produces soft values out. There is nothing that stops me from doing this. Okay, put a pi in the middle, I'm sorry. Okay, and then you have to extract the extrinsics and then 
do demapping once again with a priori information. Okay, do demapper again. Then go back and do your soft and soft and then come back and do it. Keep on doing iterations. And these iterations are actually useful in some cases. Actually, for gray mapping, these iterations are not that useful. So that's why gray mapping is preferred. And gray mapping gives you very good performance usually. Okay, so people typically prefer gray mapping and not do this iteration, but these iterations are possible. So what will happen in many situations is this will not be a simple AWGN channel. There will be some what's called ISI plus AWGN. So then what should you do here before you do demapping? You have to do something called equalization. Okay, so today people are thinking about doing soft equalization and then doing these iterations back to the equalizer. So all these things are being tried. Okay, so for the ISI case, things get more complicated. Okay, so for AWGN at least one can stop with this. Okay, so when you go to 16 QAM, 64 QAM, and 256 QAM, etc., higher order constellations, doing these simple decoders become more complex, but they can be done. They're implementable, they're very much doable, and in fact, people are proposing these kind of things. Okay, so I think that with that, we can put, an, put a big, big full stop to the, <laughs> to the whole course. And as I said, 